Hello. In this quick bite tutorial, we're going to take a look at how to use Gaussian. Gaussian is a commonly used uh, medical dyna dynamics tool that we have at CARSI. So first we're going to create a molecule using a free tool called Avogadro. Then we'll upload um, the output from that tool to the Wheeler cluster. And then we'll analyze um, the output from Avogadro using Gaussian. And then we'll download the, uh, the output and visualize it again in Avogadro. So I um, hope you're familiar with the previous videos uh, that I've created for these Quick Byte series. You don't need to know everything in there. Um, Gaussian automatically does the MPI parallelism using a tool called Linda. Uh, but you should be familiar with how to submit PBS scripts, uh, how to log in to CARSI, and even though I'll include how to upload files to Wheeler here, you might want to be familiar with that um, as well. The first thing we're going to do is download Avogadro. So I'm going to open a web browser here. Avogadro is a free tool. Um, Gaussian does come with a tool called Gauss View, but Gauss View is not licensed for home use through the university. And Avogadro, uh, for our purposes, works just as well. All right, so here's Avogadro, the free cross-platform molecular editor. It's available for Macintosh and Windows. Um, I'm going to show you how to install it here on Windows, and then in a moment I'll show you how to do it on the Macintosh. All right, so we click the download button. And you can see the Avogadro is already downloading. And it's done. Depending on your browser, this may look slightly different. But I can go to Downloads, run the Avogadro executable, and the setup uh, begins. I'm going to add it to the path for all users. Anybody who logs into this machine can use Avogadro. The installation's finished. And now if I type Avogadro here, it pops up in my menu and I can start it. Installation of Avogadro on a Macintosh looks very similar. Again, we're going to search for Avogadro. Here's the link to the Avogadro site. We're going to download it just like before. So it is slightly different on our Macintoshes, especially the most recent releases. Um, Apple doesn't always like running third-party software, so we may have to add a security exception. So we're opening the DMG file image so we can install Avogadro. We just drag it to Applications. Notice that Avogadro provides some um, sample molecules that you can, can play around with. All right, so we've installed Avogadro. I'm going to unload the um, installation image. And if I type Avogadro, uh, immediately OS X prevents me from loading it because it's not an Apple product. And uh, if I go to System Preferences, though, and I click on Security, and then General, down here at the bottom, it's going to allow me to 
um, to load that recently loaded software. So you notice I had to try and load Avogadro and then cancel. Uh, I gave you the option of either deleting the software or canceling. Once I cancel, in the security dialog, it allows me to open it anyway. It again challenges me to be really sure that I want to open this third-party software. I really do. And so after jumping through all those hoops, I'm actually able to use the software I wanted to use. So here's Avogadro. OK, now that we have Avogadro installed, let's go ahead and create a molecule. For this example, we're going to use acetyl chloride, which is a simple molecule we can use just for testing. The first thing I want to do is click on the small pen icon up at the top, the draw tool in the toolbar. That gives me access to a menu of different atoms. For this particular molecule, we're going to need two carbons. There we go. Two carbons, one oxygen, and one chlorine. But I have access to the entire periodic table if I want to add something else. So when um, Avogadro adds these atoms, it automatically uh, connects them to hydrogens. But we want to connect this chlorine with a single bond to this carbon, and a double bond from this oxygen to the carbon, and a single bond from the carbon to the other carbon. And we can do that just by selecting the right kind of bond here. So single bond for this chlorine. Let's click and drag that to the carbon and automatically removes the hydrogen. Um, and then we're going to do a bubble, double bond from the oxygen to the carbon and a single bond from that carbon to the other. So we're going to um, output this representation in Cartesian coordinates and then feed that into Gaussian. And Gaussian will try to um, optimize the geometry of this, of this molecule. But Gaussian will not converge unless we have a pretty good initial guess. This is a really bad initial guess on what this uh, molecule looks like. So I'm going to click on this little hand with a finger, and we're going to try and move it so it's a little more reasonable. All right, so that's sort of what I think the molecule is going to look like, and this is what we're going to feed into Gaussian, and Gaussian will uh, do the calculations to figure out the actual geometry. Gaussian, of course, does much more than that. It does orbitals and uh, various kinds of energies. But for our initial example, just to show how Gaussian is called um, on a molecule file on our HPC center, this is going to be sufficient. All right, so we can save this in Avogadro's own format. But to feed it into Gaussian, we're going to have to export it. So we click on the extensions uh, menu item here, click Gaussian. And let's give this a name. This is a preview of the text file that Gaussian is going to take as input. And we have various options here that apply to Gaussian. Gaussian has lots of different options um, on the different kinds of optimization it can do. We're just going to leave it for the defaults right now. All right, so let's give it a title. Uh, as I said, this is acetyl chloride. find to have it in Cartesian coordinates. You can also select um, Z-matrix coordinates, which is more of an angle geometry. And we're going to select eight processors here because each node on um, the Wheeler uh, cluster has eight cores per node. And so we're going to tell Gaussian to, to use those eight cores. We can spread it across multiple nodes, but Gaussian wants to know how many uh, cores there are per node. And we can modify this later. Um, we can add memory requirements. We can add all sorts of other analysis just by modifying this text file once we've generated it. All right, let's give this a name. Right, 
and we're done generating our file and now we can upload it to um, the HPC Center and process it with Gaussian. So now that we've generated um, our molecule and our Gaussian input file on our personal computer, the next step is to upload that file to Wheeler so we can give it to Gaussian. There are lots of ways of transferring data from one place to another, uh, from one computer to another. And I want to be exhaustive in this tutorial and show you all the steps. So I'm going to install a program called CyberDuck. CyberDuck is a free um, file transfer program that works just as well on Windows as on Macintosh. So I'm going to download CyberDuck here for Windows. Downloads complete. I'm going to run the installation program. Cyberducks installed, so I can run it here from um, the Windows search. Alright, I'm going to open a connection using the SFTP protocol, and I'm going to connect to Wheeler. So this is the um, same host name that you would have used to log into Wheeler via SSH. In fact, that's really what this compute, what this program is doing is SSHing to Wheeler and using the secure file transfer protocol to upload files. Enter in your username and password, and we can connect. The first time you connect to a machine, it's always going to ask you to confirm because it doesn't recognize this machine yet. I'm going to click always so it doesn't ask me this every time and allow. And now I can see uh, all the files that I have on the in my Wheeler home directory. Those of course will look different. And I'm going to go to my Wheeler Scratch shortcut. You'll all have a Wheeler Scratch shortcut. That takes me to the Scratch file system. So when I first connect, I'm connecting to the my home directory which is a system that's backed up, but relatively slow. The Scratch system, um, I can store a lot more data on here. It's much faster when I'm using it uh, for computations, but it's not backed up. So I'm going to create a new directory here. Let's call it Gaussian. Let's go to that, that Gaussian folder, which is empty right now. But I can drag and drop um, my output from Avogadro into that folder. All right, that's been uploaded. I'm going to use PowerShell to SSH into um, Wheeler so we can start just to verify that file is there. And I'm just going to verify the contents um, of this file to make sure it's what we expected. Uh, cat is just a program in Linux that shows the contents of, um, of text files. And there we are. So um, this is the file we created. Notice this line here. Um, this is creating a checkpoint file, which we can use for further analysis. But here are our Cartesian coordinates that we created in Avogadro. And the next step is to write a PBS submission script that will schedule a Gaussian job to analyze this file. Um, you may have already seen, or you should have already seen, the previous quick bite where I talked about how to write PBS uh, scripts. 
so you can interact with the center's uh, scheduler. But we'll go ahead and quickly write um, a Gaussian PBS script, and I'll uh, tell you what's going along um, as we go as we do that. All right, so let's name it something um, like G16. Uh, we have Gaussian 9 and Gaussian 16. May as well use Gaussian 16 since it's the later version. And we're going to use something called Linda. Linda is what handles the MPI parallelization behind the scenes. And let's uh, call it um, something like this. So I'll quickly write up this PBS file, and then I'll discuss the contents um, in a second here. Typo. There we go. All right, so let's go over the basics of what's happening in this file. Um, the first line is just telling the Linux system that this is a script. And then we have a series of PBS directives. So everything that starts with hash PBS um, are instructions to the torque scheduler. So the first thing we're saying is we want to have two compute nodes each of which has eight cores. So we're going to run this cal cal calculation on 16 cores total. And we're asking the scheduler to give us five minutes of compute time. So of course this is very short because it's just a demo, just an example. Um, you might ask for up to 48 hours of compute time. The more time you ask for, the longer it's going to take you to get scheduled if the Wheeler cluster is busy. This dash N um, is where we specify the name of the job. So when we do a QSTAT in a second here, we'll see uh, the name of our job, so we can identify what job is running where. Dash J combines the error output and the um, regular output. So what would normally be printed on the screen, if you um, had a monitor hooked up to one of these compute nodes, goes into that output file. But we're combining them so it's more convenient if there is uh, when we're looking at output. Dash little m b a e says send me an email when the job begins, when it aborts, and when it ends. So aborting means that something went wrong and the job ended early. Um, e means that it completed normally. And then dash capital M is your email address. Please don't put my email address. I don't want to uh, necessarily get notifications about all the jobs that you're running. Um, so you're going to put in your own email address here so that you get uh, emails in case it takes a long time for your job to run, or maybe Wheeler's busy and so it's going to be a few hours before your job starts, you can do other things and at your leisure uh, receive an email and come back and check the output. 
Modulo Gaussian G16. We cover, covered uh, modules, environment modules, in depth in a previous um, Quick Byte tutorial. Basically, this is how we get access to Gaussian software on the cluster. Now, Gaussian does things a little bit differently than other MPI programs, so we have to do a little bit of magic. Um, this first line here, we're giving a directive to Gaussian just to print out some more information than it would otherwise, in case we want to debug what's going on. But down here, and I've written comments to explain what's going on, where we have export Gauss WDEF and export Gauss PDEF, there we're just telling Gaussian how many nodes and how many CPUs does it have to work on. It requires a slightly different format than um, the usual format, so that's why we have to do this sed-z magic. All it's doing is condensing um, the list of host names that is normally in this PBS node file into a unique name. So Gaussian only wants to see each of those hosts even allocated, each of those compute nodes. It only wants to, see, wants to see their names once. So this is going to be fixed. No need to worry about changing this ever. And then Gaussian wants to know how many cores does it have on each of the host names that was allocated. Um, that's just a matter of mapping this PBS num PPN variable from torque to the Gaussian version. And then the very last line is super simple. It just calls G16, that's the executable for Gaussian, um, and passes in input molecule. So we define input molecule here just to be the path to um, our acetylchloride.com file we generate in Avogadro. And then the output file, which is where we want to save the results, this .log file, will have the information and the optimization um, data that Gaussian generates. All right. Now that we've written our PBS uh, script, we can submit it with QSUB. But let's first take a look at the status of the cluster to see how long it might take for our job to get scheduled. We can type QGROC, and QGROC shows me that there are three nodes available on the default queue right now. So if I start my job, there's a good chance it's going to run immediately because there's nodes free. If not, it might take um, a few hours, a few minutes before enough nodes open up uh, for me to run my job. All right, so I'm going to type QSUB. That's the QSubmission command. And then um, the name of our script, which was G16 Linda AC2. So far, so good. It gave me back a job ID. And now we can actually watch our job running. Let's see, watch qstat dash u user. All right, so this is just going to show only my jobs. The dash u um, just shows the jobs that we are submitting. It's on the default queue. Here's the job ID. It shows that I submitted it. And yes, we got two nodes and 16 cores um, allocated. And I've already received an email telling me that the job has started, and as soon as it finishes, I'll receive an email um, uh, showing the status, whether it terminated normally or not. So it's been running for 46, 48 seconds now. We allocate a maximum of five minutes. The longer we ask for, um, the more uh, the longer it'll take to get scheduled. If I ask for the full allowed time, which is 48 hours, and it lasts for a lot of nodes, it might take the scheduler a long time to find an open slot um, that's that, that'll accommodate that. Now the scheduler uses an algorithm that makes sure that all jobs scheduled um, that require less than 48 hours and have less than our limit of 50 nodes will eventually get scheduled. Uh, it just might take a lot longer um, and other jobs. All right, and the job just finished, and I got my notification email telling me that um, the results are ready. Exit status was zero. That's a good sign. Software in general returns a zero when it exited normally. Uh, there'll be a, some other number if there was an error of some sort. And it gives me the path to um, 
where the results were written. So let's take a look at those results. All right, so this is the debug output from Linda talking about scheduling workers on the different nodes. And it looks like things went okay. And let's take a look at the log output. That's the output that Gaussian generated that is our result. I'm going to use the less command, just another way of looking at uh, text files. So we named it pseudochloride.log. All right, here's the output. There's our eight workers per node. And here's the two nodes that it ran on. So it looks at first glance as if everything went okay. Let's scroll down through all the calculations. So um, for computational chemists, there's lots of interesting data here uh, that can be used to understand this molecule. But what I care about right now is right at the end, normal termination of Gaussian 16. So that indicates to me that Gaussian at least believes that everything went okay. It was able to solve the optimization problem and properly um, uh, place those atoms in relation to each other. Now, of course, there's a, a wealth of other information in here, but uh, that's all we care about for this tutorial. All right, so now that we have some output from Gaussian, we'd like to um, take that output file and put it back onto our personal machine so we can take a look at it with Avogadro. So Cyberduck is still connected to that same directory we've been working with on the Scratch file system. And all I have to do is uh, double click the acetylchloride.log um, file. It downloaded it. And I can find it here in my downloads folder. So I'm going to open it up in a text file. So as a text editor. And here's what we saw a minute ago on, um, on Wheeler, but now it's on my machine. And I can open this with Avogadro. So what I'm going to do is right click and open with. Try and find Avogadro. All right, here is our optimized acetyl chloride molecule. All right, um, that's the end of this tutorial. Please let me know if you have any problems or questions. Um, uh, by sending an email to help at carsey.unm.edu. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.